Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Maggie Chapman, member of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee of the Scottish Parliament, and I would like to welcome you all to the special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021, in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scottish Futures Forum, of which I am a board member. This afternoon's panel is titled, Is the North to Blame for the Climate Crisis? and is held in partnership with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussion. A recent Goldsmiths University report put the Global North as responsible for 92% of excess global carbon emissions. Though North America and Europe are now experiencing floods and wildfires on a new scale, it is the Southern Hemisphere that is bearing the brunt of flooding, droughts, famine, migration, and the political unrest that comes with this. Should the North pay reparations to the climate vulnerable countries for decades of the developed world's overconsumption? And where do we stand on consumption-based emissions, where largely Western countries outsource production to high emitting China and India? What are the ethical and realistic financial impacts of the inequalities of the climate crisis? This panel aims to address all of these questions and much more, I'm sure, in the next hour or so. So please do stay with us. We are delighted that you're all able to join us to take part. And I would encourage you all to please use the event chat function to introduce yourselves, stating your name and your geographical location, and also to use that event chat function to pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. We're having a little technical issue for, with the Q&A um, panel, so, so make sure it is the event chat panel. I would now like to introduce our three panellists. We have Dr. Tijal Kanetkar, who is the Associate Professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bengaluru, India. We have Mike Robinson, Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, mm -hmm. and Danai Kriokupulu, Senior Policy Fellow at Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics. Welcome, all three. Just to set the scene a, a little bit, we'll have an opportunity to hear from each of our three panelists. Panelists, you, you will have the, the opportunity to, to, to speak for, 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 for a few moments, and then our online audience can put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please put them into the event chat. Make sure you state your first name and where you are from this afternoon, and we'll get through as many of you as possible. I would also like to begin by asking each of our panelists as what they see, uh, what they see are the priority issues when it comes to the ethical and realistic financial impacts on the inequalities of the climate crisis. I will come first to you, Tijal, if that's okay, and then to Mike, then Danai. So Tijal, over to you, please, if you would outline your thoughts. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, let me just very briefly uh, speak about. I hope I'm clear. Uh, let me just very. I think I'm having some issues with my internet, but uh, I hope uh, they get sorted out as this goes uh, on. But let me just very briefly first outline uh, a very simple answer to the question: Is the North to blame for the climate crisis? And of course, it's very easy to give a very short answer to that and say yes, but uh, not in some uh, sort of uh, you know, bizarre conspiratorial kind of manner uh, that is often spoken of when about liabilities like that. But even if we look at, uh, so for example, at the, at the, in the time of industrialization, the benefits of uh, access to natural resources. The use of natural resources without any environmental constraints, uh, other than you know perhaps technological constraints that were overcome from time to time, the global north has had the the, uh, the opportunity to access these resources and use them without constraint, and therefore has benefited from uh, from this. Uh, however, the global south has not. The process of industrialization, the move out of primary sectors of production. Uh, has, has been delayed in the Global South, and it still is ongoing in many parts, uh, uh, many, many countries of the Global South. And so when we talk about a transition in this context today, 
uh, while it is a transition for the global north, for the global south, it really isn't a transition in that sense. We are transitioning, we are, we are still in the process of the first transition into a developed, modernized society. And so therefore, I think in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it was very, it was enshrined the principle of differentiation between developed and developed, developing countries, uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities is very much a part of uh, that entire uh, document of the convention. Uh, and developed countries realize that they have to take the lead and therefore uh, do something. But since even after this recognition and after a consensus on this recognition in the convention, there has been very little action from the global north on climate change. And this, I think, is where the responsibility, uh, you know, even, even though they've had a historical, they've had the historical benefits of access to resources. Uh, since 1990, when we've acknowledged the problem of climate change, even after that, the action has been uh, not forthcoming. And what we've seen in the last 30 years of the climate change negotiation, constant attempt to keep pushing uh, the goalposts further and further. You know, you have uh, every time uh, it is clear that the global north is not meeting its targets, the targets are pushed further into the future. Now we have this uh, new target of net neutrality by 2050, which is 30 years into the future. Uh, what And what lies behind us is a history of inaction from the global north. So, uh, yes, in that sense, I think the global north is responsible for the crisis that we see. Yeah, and more, more importantly, I think, uh, is responsible for the stalemate there that we are facing in terms of meaningful action for the future. So uh, I think I think I missed uh, when you said how much time we can take for our initial opening comments. So perhaps I'll stop with that this year at this point. Th thank, thank you very much, Tijal, and and I'm sure we will pick up on on some of those points uh, over over the next next hour or so. Can I go to Mike then? Mike, what 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 are you, what are your opening remarks? Your, your first few minutes on on this. Um, thanks, Maggie. Um, again, just for the sake of not saying yes and moving on, um, the uh, there's there's a sort of yes and no in my head in a way. Um, I, I don't particularly like this in principle of blame because I'm trying to focus interest on solutions, but I do fully appreciate that in terms of climate justice, it's very difficult uh, not to to blame the the global north. Of course, I mean, if you go far enough north, that doesn't uh, that doesn't equate. You've got all the Inuit communities that um, suffer many of the same issues uh, that the global south does too. So, um, I think sometimes what we forget, um, I mean, climate change to me isn't optional, nor is um, working towards transition at home, nor is helping others towards a low carbon tra trajectory. And it's inconceivable that we, to me, that we shouldn't help those most impacted by climate change especially because the Global North is still causing the majority of it and has historically, of course. And, and particularly since 1979 is the day I would sort of pin down as the first, the world's first climate conference. And from, so from that moment onward, it felt like we were doing it on purpose, at least until then we had the slight excuse that perhaps we didn't know any better. So for me, I guess the issue though is, um, is to sort of get a bit deeper into the root of what is really the problem. I mean, I'd, I'd love to say that some of it was just um, a lack of imagination and, uh, uh, a sort of habitual use of business as usual, um, but it, it's a, it's sort of the wrong obsessions. It's the wrong priorities and value systems. Um, Overemphasising single measures, single metrics like GDP at the expense of everything else, and that clearly is not very clever. I, it worries me how slow we are to react. Um, I think the closest similarity to climate change is actually smog. Um, you know, it took. I mean, I mean, it, you know, it took a very serious incident in London before the Clean Air Act. Even that was four years after the incident in 1956. But smog wasn't a new issue. It had been around for centuries. And and if you need the evidence, if you think about where all the poor parts of cities are in the UK, they're all in the east, because that was the prevailing wind direction. So if you had the money, you moved west. This was well understood for. To, to the extent that it dictated the shape of our towns and cities. So it wasn't a new phenomenon, and yet it took a huge, huge effort and a disaster before something was really properly done about it. 
I think where we're going, though, it's interesting is not only is there sort of moral and ethical responsibility, of course, um, to tackle this, but I think there's an inevitability to around issues like litigation. You're seeing campaigns like Ecocide starting to step up, which are starting to give um, actual teeth, legal teeth to the environment and some of the sort of points of this inequality. And I think that that means that I hope that that's sort of a wake up bell to realise that we really need to tackle this at scale and quickly, because inevitably there's going to be a future of all sorts of litigation and other issues too. So where we've got to, I think, is, a, is, is an inability to listen to the science, but it's also fundamentally about wealth and it's not necessarily purely about geography. There are plenty of um, poor people within the Global North that haven't done a huge amount to bring this about. And so it, it is very closely correlated with, with wealth and the wealthiest 10% consume 20 times what the poorest 10% do. And so it, for me, it is that unsustainability. And I think the other issue I'd just like to sort of put on the table is that in my view, inequality is unsustainable. It's just, it's, it, it's imbalancing. It, it isn't something that can persist in the long term. And, and shouldn't be allowed to. So, and I think actually it's in everybody's best interests to tackle inequality because it's one facet of unsustainability. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. And could I turn now to Danai? Danai, would you like to, to uh, give us your, your initial thoughts on this? Thank you, Maggie, and thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the question is, as previous speakers have highlighted, simplistic and can be answered very quickly with a, with a yes answer. But I think in terms of going beyond that, I think we can have a more nuanced understanding of what we mean by blame, because it's not a simple north-south divide, um, as others have highlighted. Yes, it is perhaps the biggest one, and the, and the distinction between developing and developed economies is very helpful in that sense and has been part of the convention and part of the COP language. But also we should think of it as an intergenerational issue as well. Um, so generations, younger generations in the global north also have no responsibility of this. Perhaps they are, um, they have benefited by having greater economic opportunities than younger generations in the global south have. So there is an inequality there. Uh, but I think we should also see it in that way. And also within country inequalities that are very strong in developed economies. Um, so it's not just about um, north and south uh, and uh, we should uh, think about it in a more nuanced way. I think number two is that, um, yes, if, if there is a, a more responsibility and a moral responsibility by the Global South because of this historic uh, overweight in terms of having access to an economic model that has not internalized environmental cost and climate um, effects, um, yes, there may be a moral imperative for greater action by developed economies. But there is also an economic imperative because climate change is a global issue and we should not forget that the global south or developing economies are not only the ones least responsible for what is happening in the climate crisis, but they're also the ones least equipped to address it. And if we take a more forward-looking approach and a more solutions-focused approach, as uh, the previous speaker was highlighting, then that it is what should be concerning us more rather than the historic responsibility because if there is no support from those who have access to it and who have more resources to address it to those who don't um, then there is a very high risk that these economies these communities uh, these groups will resort to the same easy form of growth that that the developed world has gone through to develop and to industrialize in the past so um, small communities that may not have access to sustainable development opportunities may uh, go for um, uh, taking advantage of their natural resources in an unsustainable way. And that in turn is bad for everyone because it will contribute to higher emissions um, and the whole world will lose out of that. So it is in the economic interest of those who have those resources to support those who don't. Um, I think it's also important to say that um, Yes, it is about blame that there is a cost to addressing this, but it is also an opportunity. And I think it's very much an opportunity for developing economies who are able to, in a way, leapfrog by designing their economic uh, models and their growth models in a more sustainable way, that they have not gone through the same development process as the countries who are 
uh, polluting and have now to mitigate their um, effects on climate change and their levels of emission. So they, they start more with a, um, a cleaner start, let's say, and I think that is an opportunity. It's also an opportunity if you think about it geographically in terms of the opportunities for renewable energy generation, for example, for building more sustainable transport systems and developed economy, private sector capital, as well as development finance, uh, can make a lot of returns out of this. So it is also in their interest in that way to support mitigation efforts in uh, that, that take advantage of resources in developing economies. We should, of course, not also forget about the adaptation finance that is needed, because even in the best case scenario of a 1.5 degree temperature increase, uh, a lot of the communities in the global south will have to adapt um, will have to um, have will have to face uh, higher frequency and more intense natural disasters for example so we can talk about that as well because it's not a, a just about uh, mitigation um, and then I think the next question and perhaps we can move into that in the discussion is if we agree among ourselves here in the panel that yes there is this moral and economic responsibility then what form does this take and it can take many forms um, reparations is something that has been suggested in the event description but there is also um, other formats and uh, forms of finance that are already on the agenda that are already on the table the climate finance the support through multilateral development banks um, the 100 billion commitment for climate finance uh, that was made and has not yet been acted on but should be so we should also think about what is on the table and what form this should take thank you Thank you very much, Dan. I th th thank you all for, for those opening opening thoughts. You you all talked a little bit about um, th that that tension, I suppose, between blame and responsibility. And I, I, I wonder, Tijal, could could you say a little bit more about from from your perspective, how, how how do we balance those things that 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 distinction? Because yes, th there is overwhelming evidence of, of, of the disproportionate impact um, that the global north has had. But, but as, as Mike has said as well, blame sometimes isn't very helpful. So, so Tijal, from your experience, how, how, do we, how do we tease out that, that distinction between blame, responsibility, and I suppose accountability? Well, I think uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I'm glad that this uh, panel uh, has much wider scope uh, in terms of here to discuss, and a lot of the I agree with a lot of the things that uh, my fellow panelists said. Uh, but if you look at the general literature on climate change, uh, unfortunately, sometimes I think we are reinventing the wheel, uh, not looking at the entire literature on redistributive justice, etc., that has gone before uh, the climate crisis was really as big as uh, that we now. So we are not necessarily talking in terms of reparations and liability or ways uh, when we speak of justice, uh, right? That notion of justice yeah, does go much beyond simply assigning blame and asking for reparations from individual, uh, you know, entities. And so here, uh, and I, I think why I brought up the convention is because I think that balancing that we that you're, that you're asking about is in some sense uh, there's a very good attempt in the convention because you're not necessarily saying that people pay reparations but you're saying that uh, the global north takes the lead takes the lead in what way is is uh, is much uh, mitigates much faster moves to cleaner energy systems much faster um, uh, provides support both financial and technological support to the global south so that it can perhaps uh, not have, you know, leapfrog, uh, as uh, I used the term, leapfrog to technologies where possible. It's not always possible in my opinion to do this for various reasons, and I'll speak about that in the brief. But uh, that is what it is. The language is very different from the language of blame. Of, uh, it is a language of uh, distributive justice. I think that uh, that uh, that is something that we need to uh, keep at the center of uh, understanding this, because, uh, because uh, as much as we do, I think realize and agree that uh, there is, of course, inequality within nations. We we also have inequality between generations, but it does matter where you are poor. The inequality between nations, between the global north and south, is overwhelmingly more. 
then inter intra country inequality. Um, and this is shown by a, a lot of studies that there are out there. If you like, take simple metric of uh, you know, access inequality, etc., within countries, also we see that north south inequalities overwhelm the intra country inequality. And so uh, it does matter where you are rich, it does matter where you are poor. Not, uh, that is not uh, the same. And this inequality gets reproduced across generations as then I also pointed out. So, so, so there is a reason why we have uh, the particular you know, manner of differentiation which is developed in developing countries. And um, while we think about, uh, there is, a, you know, we've also written, I've also written, for example, of debt, and we think of what it means in terms of monetizing this carbon debt, um, it is, it's not all of the uh, carbon emission of the global north that, uh, that constitute a carbon debt. It is over and above a particular amount that has been used by the, by the global north. And this is, of course, uh, you know, it, it is uh, uh, mediated by which emissions do you consider? And, uh, it, like Mike said, from 1990 onwards, we've acknowledged this. I mean, before that, we had an excuse, but from 1990 onwards, it's been acknowledged that this is a problem. And so then, what do you do about uh, it from 1990 onwards? And the answer is, of course, nothing. And so then, do we assign a liability for, for what has happened since 1990? Um, and uh, at least, if not for before that. And so that becomes a, a question uh, you know, that we need to answer. And I just want to just, uh, you know, one of the things that I think going forward, uh, at least that we should check, uh, is that we do not, uh, and I agree that this is an economic uh, issue. When we speak of leapfrogging and new technologies to address this, and the global north uh, providing that support, it is not private capital in the global north that should profiteer from uh, this climate crisis. And this is what will happen if we say that you know private capital should see this as opportunity to also help developing countries uh, sort of leapfrog to newer technologies. Because then what that means is that developing country citizens, consumers, pay private capital in the global north to mitigate a problem that is largely, uh, that, the, that the global north is largely responsible for. And then you have a new situation of uh, potentially green debt, because climate finance, as we all know uh, right now, a lot of it is private equity. And uh, we do uh, wonder whether going forward here, we are going to be faced uh, in the global south, we are going to be faced with situations of debt uh, and being beholden to technologies and royalties that we need to pay to private capital in the global north for technologies that uh, they're supposed to, that should uh, theoretically be in the open door. We've seen this with the vaccines uh, that have, the, you know, this issue with the vaccines right now during the pandemic. How do we avoid that going forward? So more than blame, I think, uh, can we at least check all the problems that we've had in the last 30 years? Can we check that those don't repeat and reproduce inequalities in the future? I think that, that is the least that we can do. Thank you, Tijal. Mike, I wonder if I could come to you. In, in, your, in your opening remarks, you talked about the, the increase um, the, the, the increased litigation, you know, discussion around ecocide and seeking uh, litigious justice routes, I suppose. What, what is your view about the balance between those, the, those um, approaches to try and, and take, take account of, of the inequalities that we've been talking about and e economic pressures that Tijal, well, you, you, you've, all, you've all alluded to? How, 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 do, we, how do we navigate that, that tension? Um, thanks, Maggie. I, I think there's a lot of answers to that, really. The first is that we, of course, overfixate on very narrow measures often, and, um, and, and they are very narrow, um, as I keep reminding people, as I'm sure it's not news. I mean, GDP is a terrible measure. Even Simon Kuznets, who invented GDP, thought it was a bad measure of prosperity, and yet we haven't got rid of it. And it's partly because it's easy to count, but the thing that people forget is what it doesn't do. And what it 
doesn't do is it doesn't count the damage that you've created to get to, to, to do it, to build it. So you can build GDP, but if you've ignored everything you've done to get there, then you're slightly being, well, you're being very, very blinkered. So I do think there's a huge pressure which comes back to this issue about systemic change and the need for quite serious um, value system shifts, I think. Um, GDP is a very narrow part of the economy, which is a narrow part of society, which is a small part of the whole of the world. And, you know, and yet we sort of, we've turned that on its head. One of the issues is that it's far too easy to um, externalize the damage that we do, which basically means not be responsible for it and ignore it. And I just think that if we're trying to be sustainable and we've, I don't think we've ever been sustainable as a species before, so we're sort of learning this now, but in order to be sustainable, you cannot externalize the damage that you do. You just can't. It's crazy. If you're digging a massive hole to create a mound over here, at some point you've got a really, really big hole. So um, I just think that actually, so I do think some of the answer to this is that systemic move away from just counting very, very narrow measures and thinking more broadly. But I think in the litigation terms, I also think it's just inevitable that as things become scarcer as we create more overt and obvious damage, that there is a need to, to actually put a framework around the environment and the protection of our communities, um, because they're one of those externalities up until now. So I think there's going to be that inevitable pressure, which will lead ultimately, undoubtedly, to litigation. I think that's actually a vehicle now that people need to wake up to. If they're going to consciously pursue what we know to be unsustainable ends, it makes absolute sense that not in the best interest of humanity. So why wouldn't there be some sort of legal reparation? And it may be one of the things that we do that allows us to start fueling and funding some of this other change. I think picking up a little bit on what Tija was saying as well, one of the other things I'm very keen that we do see more of is sort of shared knowledge and, and sort of free flowing knowledge across uh, between North and South and, and, and all the different parties in here. I do think there's huge opportunities. One of the very exciting uh, solutions and projects that we've been working with recently is around geopolymer cement. And um, with, you know, cement is 7% of global emissions. The industry isn't really doing anything to sort this out. It's sort of waiting on carbon capture and storage to come along. And actually there are alternatives. And the, the thing that's fantastic about geopolymer is that every community in the world is within 50 miles of a source of geopolymer cement. So some of the solutions in here that I really am keen to see accelerated and they need to be advantaged economically to allow that to take place, they actually make communities and societies more self-reliant which has to be a positive thing too. So hopefully that answers great. your question. <laughs> yeah, great. Th thank you, Mike. And before I bring Dana in, can, can I just remind everybody, please do, do put your questions in the event chat. Uh, we're keen to hear different perspectives or, or, or challenges from, from where you are. So, so please please do, do pop things in, in, in the event chat as, as we go. Um, Dan, I, you, you spoke quite a lot about inequality, particularly uh, ge geographic inequality, but also intergenerational equality and, and the complexities within that, how uh, wealthy people in the global south are maybe more responsible than very poor people in, in the global north, uh, young people d differentially responsible um, for, for climate emissions in different parts of the world. How can we, how, how can we really balance that, that class analysis, if you like, that class nature of environmental degradation of, of, of climate change with the geographical nature of its impact? I think what is coming out quite strongly in the discussion is that we need to rethink really the fundamentals. What Mike was talking about in terms of how we measure progress, how we measure sustainable growth, we really need to think the economic model. And I think also now that we are planning a recovery from another economic crisis related to the pandemic, that is an opportunity to not just build back better, to build forward, to uh, rethink the way that our economies are uh, structured. And I think at the heart of that needs to be um, that we do not replicate these inequalities in this new economic system. And, and TJ also made that point very convincingly in terms of uh, we need to make sure in, the, in that the new economy, which the green transition is the growth story of the 21st century. It will create a lot of jobs, but we need to make sure that there is also more equality, that the transition is not just a green one, but also a just transition 
Uh, and that does not just mean leave no one behind. It does not just mean that everyone is able to participate in it and that the technologies and so on are also shared by um, uh, countries more uh, equally. And it does not mean that um, we have jobs for those who are part in industries that uh, are no longer part of the new economy, but it means that these jobs also need to be good jobs. They need to be remuner remunerated well. Um, they need to be secure. Um, we need to have uh, structures in place uh, for, these, for people who lose their jobs in, in old sectors to transition into new ones, do not face barriers in entering those new sectors. Um, and I think that applies across generations as well in terms of uh, people who may not have access to the same opportunities to be able to take advantage of those that come with this new economy. And I think that is very important and that applies to within country inequalities, but also to across country in terms of making sure that everyone can participate uh, in that transition. And we see that very much in terms of the movements that we are seeing in the climate agenda. They are, uh, climate is an issue that unites um, young generations across borders, um, people who have suffered from in, in long-standing and historical inequalities across borders as well, but also this question of responsibility to build a system that is more equal. Super. Th th thank you. Thank you, Danai. Uh, j just just to 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 re reiterate, if anybody has any points they, they would like to make, please please pop those in, into the event chat as well. Um, I, I just want to to pick up on on this this point about system change. And I you, you, broadly speaking, I I, I don't think. You, well, you're certainly not going to get any argue, argument from me that that we we need a radically different economic system to to be able to ensure equality not only within countries but 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 globally as well. Can we use some of the measures that that we currently use? Mike, you've already talked about the, the problems associated with things like GDP, but if, if we're talking about carbon accounting or, or, or measuring and, and and attributing carbon in, in effective ways, do do we need to think differently about how we do that? If we're saying the system we've got in, is in and of itself problematic, how do, how do we then continue to use that same system or the measurements and the, the structures within that system to account for, for emissions, to account for um, sort of full, carbon cost, uh, full carbon costing in, in supply chains, those kinds of things. Do, do, we need, do we need to be thinking about different things even, even in, those, in, in those areas? M Mike, do you yeah. want to? Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. Danai, do, do you want to come in on that? And Maybe I can, I can come in with some points about the economic and financial system where I come from, because I think it goes both ways in terms of both expanding the toolkit that uh, we have, but also rethinking it and using the existing tools that we have in different ways. So, for example, in economic modeling, there are there is work to incorporate long-term variables and tipping points, crossing of thresholds that are associated with climate, which have not traditionally been part of economic models that have been more focused on the short and medium term, uh, which have not had such variables be part of them. Similarly, in terms of, um, for example, central banking and regulation, uh, where we have tools such as um, economic stress tests to check whether banks are resilient in a number of economic scenarios. Now, these are being adapted in the form of climate stress tests to look at whether in, in different climate scenarios, uh, the banking system can be resilient, needs to have more capital to address those. Um, in terms of financial instruments as well, uh, these are being adapted to uh, create, uh, to, to align more with uh, what is needed for the climate transition. We have a lot of uh, innovation, for example, with um, green bonds or blue bonds or sustainability linked bonds as well. International financial institutions are also rethinking and expanding their toolkits uh, to channel more finance uh, towards the green transition. We are seeing um, considerations, for example, at the International Monetary Fund about redeploying the special drawing rights, the contributions that members of the IMF are making uh, for climate or climate for debt swaps and, and tying repayments of debt to progress on, on climate targets, for example. Um, there is also financing me mechanisms that multilateral development banks have that can be redeployed and expanded to address the climate objectives. So in the financial system, we are seeing more of a tweaking, but also expansion of the toolkit uh, in that direction. But in terms of system change, I think we need to use the actors and the uh, players that we already have on the system. A lot of the multilateral development banks 
uh, have a lot of experience in, in that area in terms of supporting development sustainably. The European Investment Bank was the first to issue a green bond back in 2007. So they have been doing a lot of work in this space for, for quite some time. So I think we need to make sure that every existing actor in the system is deployed in, uh, to their best abilities for this uh, goal. But we also need to see the emergence of new markets and of new players. And we need to, to get system change in that way as well. Thanks, Danai. Mike. I mean, there's a lot of things I would, I mean, I agree with a lot of that, echo a lot of that. Although I, I have to say that in my experience, one of the things I find quite quite disappointing is the um, the conservative nature of existing financial systems. And um, I, I'm deeply conservative. I, I do remember having a conversation with pension funds a number of years ago, uh, and there was guaranteed returns on wind energy um, for 25 years, and they still viewed that as too high risk and uh, therefore didn't want to invest. And um, and so the likelihood of getting investment in things like tidal energy was non-existent from, from the private sector. And another conversation I had with uh, international financiers not that long ago, within the last two years, they were talking about nine trillion of disinvested funds on the international market. Now that in itself seems like a good thing, but there's a danger that if it's channeled in the wrong direction, it's not helpful. And a lot of it currently is looks like it's being channeled into offsetting effectively, which should be the last port of call, not the first. And so suddenly there's a huge demand for land and uh, places to plonk trees. Um, it's already impacting in the UK. Um, but it, it, first of all, it shouldn't be the first thing you do. As I say, it would preferably it would be the last one. But the other thing that was really shocking about this conversation with these financiers was they said to me, and this is two years ago, they said that there was a general sense of shock amongst their, that this conference that they were at in Paris, that coal had gone from being a, a stable of any investment portfolio to uninvestable in the space of three years. And I thought that was really telling. Um, in fact, I thought it was so shocking that that's why I worked with two universities and the Institute of Directors to establish a climate understanding force, because I suddenly realized that, that these finance people were not keeping up with the science and not even within the last 15, 20 years, coal was predictably in decline as an investment opportunity. And so it should be. And so we need to accelerate the process by which the things that are not good fall out of favor. We need to find real money quickly to support a lot of this transition. Um, I, remember, I remember a very famous quote that said, you can judge a government's commitments by its budget. And actually very few budgets genuinely bear any scrutiny if you're looking at climate. So there are some really obvious things I think that we can do there. But the other one, of course, is if we're talking about um, system change, one of the very obvious principles around fairness is the idea of giving people some sort of per capita quota of carbon credits. And actually, that is instantly redistributive. You know, it's it's immediately uh, effectively creating an alternative currency in to, to all intents and purposes. And so there are some interesting ideas out there. I'm not sure we've worked it all out yet by any stretch of the imagination, but there's certainly some really interesting radical ideas that I think could bring about quite significant shifts. Super. Th thanks, Mike. Tishal, I wonder if, if I can come to you. In, you, you talked about the, the, the failure of, of the target system, of how targets have always been pushed back and uh, countries have failed repeatedly to meet the targets that, that, that they've set. Um, what, what are your thoughts around how we make sure we plan for, for shocks, given that the market seems to be so bad at delivering uh, for us on those targets for a whole range of reasons that, that we, we, we have already been discussing. How, how can we plan for plan better for the shocks that we are seeing come, come through, whether they are climate shocks, COVID shocks or, 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 or others? If, if, yeah, if we can't rely on, on that kind of target driven, driven approach. No, I, uh, one thing is, uh, I think that we need to really have from the global north, answer your question very shortly, is from the global north, short term targets. What, are, what, what do countries plan to do in the next five years? What do they plan to do? I mean, there has to be some long term strategy, yes, but there need to be short term targets. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think we've been speaking about uh, this sort of entire idea of system change and, and economic system. Uh, also need to change 
I really wonder what that means in a system, in a, in a, in a situation of extreme global inequality, right? And, and there's been a, a lot of focus on uh, the markets and, and um, uh, you know, multilateral agencies, the World Bank, IMF, etc. And what they've been doing right now in terms of rating in terms uh, for, you know, for climate uh, rating investment projects, etc. I would, in fact, disagree with my fellow panelists and say that this, I think, in my opinion, extremely uh, unequal, the way in which uh, this sort of seem to, a lot of these multilateral uh, development seem to simply brush aside any questions of equity, uh, in fact, even uh, put aside what has been uh, agreed to in the convention in different documents of the climate negotiations of the UN and sort of come up with their own metrics uh, for uh, how they um, rate countries or rate different projects in terms of uh, uh, performance. IMF, for example, plans or the ADB, IMF, etc. All of these banks are, are planning to, uh, they have a prop, they, they, they're planning to stop investing in coal and there's a lot of pressure uh, in terms of stopping coal investments. So what are countries of the global south? And I mean, forget uh, China and India for, for, for that right now, if you want to, assuming these countries have their own funds to fund their own fossil fuel projects if they want. I don't think China is going to wait for one of the multilateral uh, banks to fund its uh, coal projects. But uh, what about other countries, uh, for example, in uh, where you don't have gas? And it's important to remember that a lot of the, uh, the, the reduction in nuclear energy in the global north has been uh, replaced by dirty uh, fuels. It's not been replaced by renewable energy, and the coal reduction has been replaced by gas. It's not been uh, renewable energy. In fact, if you take a look at what uh, India has done, for example, in terms of uh, renewable energy installments, it's much higher than Germany in the last three years. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the, so the transition in the global north has been to gas. Now, you have countries where hydro potentials are low, gas is not available. Uh, renewable energy is not domestically produced, so you have a high import dependence here uh, for renewable energy, even if it is available, uh, you know, the technology is available. And so all of these countries are going to be severely import dependent for their, uh, for their renewable energy needs. And then you are basically stopping them from all kinds of money for, and, and development banks are supposed to focus on development. Uh, so, if, if it is required, in fact, that let's say a country in Africa requires a coal project, that coal project should be funded and offset against reductions in the global north. That's the way in which we should think about reparations, uh, if, if at all. I mean, I, and not some sort of blanket ban on coal. I don't think that's going to work. In fact, I think going forward, if we start applying the same metric with the same timelines, across countries, what we are going to do is exacerbate inequalities. And this is the fear from the group. And it's a very justified, I think, valid fear that all of us have. That applying the same timelines, the same metrics, with a lot of optimistic language of opportunity and uh, you know, investment. What have we seen in terms of these, this opportunity in the last 30 years? What has happened? Why is it that the global north is finding it so difficult to transition out of fossil fuels? Is it a matter of, I mean, why is it that they haven't done it? If it is so easy, if there are so many opportunities, why is it that countries haven't done it yet? And why is it, therefore, that it becomes suddenly an opportunity when it comes to developing countries having to take action, but developed countries don't see it as an opportunity? So, so bringing that discussion back to the north-south divide, I would say that when we, even when we speak about system change, etc., are we talking about not depending on markets then? Is that because system change happens at different levels. We talk about planning, not markets. We talk about technologies in the public domain, no IPR. Is that is that the level of system change we are, we are agreeing? Or are we again talking about financial markets and uh, uh, you know, development banks being interested in uh, and, and private profit uh, in, you know, going forward? Are we sort of, system change is only so, is okay in so far as we take into consideration uh, climate uh, impacts of GDP growth. That's all we, we mean when we say system. 
but everything else in the system you, you know if it, or you take economic models uh, you know uh, price, profit maximization versus utility maximization all of those assumptions of how systems work remain the same then it's not going to work going forward at least from the perspective of and so we really need something much more concrete on the table and not really um, you know very sort of optimistic language and rhetoric but really backed by no action Th th thank you, Tijal. I, I wonder, th th there's been a question come in from Graham in Dumfries, and I think this, this links into to what you, you've just been talking about. Graham asks, do we need to move to more localised rather than the current globalised economy? So do, do we need more localised economies, and how do we, how do we deal with, with the, the sort of the different approaches and, and views on degrowth? Um, and, and obviously the, the, the differential impacts that that would have in different parts of the world. Tijal, could, could you could you just pick up on 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 that? Yeah. Yeah. No. So uh, you know, I think uh, I am a little skeptical. Uh, let me say upfront about uh, degrowth arguments uh, because I mean we've seen what has happened. Of course, you know it, it is a very con contextual. In different contexts, it's worth works differently. And if you're talking about the global north, very I mean, stable economies where really largely the problem is one of redistribution of wealth, of resources, then it's a very different question where the focus should be on sort of fossil fuel trip. Should not be. I mean, there is there is significant scope for redistribution. Whereas in large parts of the global south, you need some material change or transformational social change. You need, we need to address issues of gender, we need to address issues of uh, you know, pre modern uh, forms of exploitation that still exist across various uh, uh, economies of the global south. And this doesn't simply happen off the hat by, by saying that you know, things will change or uh, we need material change. So we need our productive capacities to change, we need our systems of production to change. For example, in India, there is uh, are, uh, you know, we have a huge informal industrial, fragmented industrial uh, production. Right? And this is uh, uh, the basis of a lot of wage exploitation within the country. Now, but however, uh, this is not something that happened that you see necessarily in large, more formalized, capitalized uh, sectors, even within the country. But this large informal segment needs a leg up in terms of uh, change and that's not simply going to happen by redistributing you need to have something to redistribute and that's something that that's something that you need to have itself is unavailable in itself. so yes we we need different strategies across uh, the, and what we are looking at and coming back to the issue connecting this to climate change we are definitely looking at more than 1.5 I know that uh, uh, that that the, that the COP presidency this time is uh, the tagline is keeping 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. But uh, you know, in my opinion, 1.5 is is already dead. What the developed countries are doing is also making sure that even two degrees Celsius is on its way to a pretty premature death. So if, if you don't want that to happen, then what what we need, what the global South needs, is development because that's what we need to do to adapt. We are going to see more than 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, change, and so our people need housing, our people need healthcare, our people need, uh, you know, employment and resilience, and that is where we really need to. Focus. So uh, I don't know how a narrative of degrowth necessarily is going to uh, help the global south. Of course, there is a mo much more nuanced argument to be made in terms of uh, in both places, both the global. That is what I would focus on much arguments of the group. Okay, th th thank you, Tijal. Danai, can I bring you in um, to, to pick up on some of the points Tijal has made, but, but also um, Gordon in the chat has asked, Link, linking to, to those discussions about degrowth and, and that, that challenge between local and, and, and the glob globalized economy, um, are, would carbon credits be be, be a way to go. Is there, is there something to be said for a rationing system? Are, are, are there are there other financial or economic 
um, things that we, we need to be thinking about here. Yes, thank you. No, very interesting discussion so far. And I think um, it's, it's a big question on whether we see sustainable development and economic development and climate action as fundamentally at odds with each other. I don't think they are because I think uh, I, we cannot imagine an econ a future where there is economic development if we don't take action on climate change. So there is the question of the cost of inaction and how much worse off everyone will be if we do not address that. So yes, there can be very particular, very difficult decisions if you have a community that does not have an alternative to um, energy, um, either uh, energy security or um, energy generation than non-clean forms of energy. And what do you do in that situation? Uh, because if you if you prioritize climate action, you may harm economic development. But at the same time, if you do not take action on, on mitigating the effects of, of the climate crisis, then you will very quickly be worse off. And in that sense, I think it is an opportunity because the cost of inaction is so immense that everyone will be worse off in that scenario and, and everyone has to adjust. And as I said earlier, developing economies in the Global South is in a much better place in terms of uh, not generating already um, such high emissions levels. There's much more of a transition that needs to be made in the global north. But at the same time, it's not just about the cost of inaction, it's also about the benefits to action. And I think there are opportunities there in terms of uh, new jobs, better kinds of jobs, uh, in terms of uh, growth. And yes, on the argument of degrowth, again, I don't think uh, that they are incompatible. I think there is that's the only way to have economic growth is by taking climate action. And we are seeing now in this pandemic as well how vulnerable the economy and the financial system can be to factors that are coming outside of it because the financial crisis that we had in 2008 was a crisis that was generated in the financial system and spread to the real economy. And what we're seeing with the pandemic, what we are seeing with the climate crisis is that there's factors that are affecting the economy and we cannot have a healthy economy without a healthy planet, without healthy people. So there are opportunities there. It doesn't mean that it's about profit to be made by private capital in the global north, but without every actor doing its part and um, assuming its role in, in the system that we have and, and directing resources in that, in that way, then there are not that many alternative ways to get action done now. The kind of numbers that we need uh, are trillions to get from the 2.1 uh, uh, degree increase, which was in the International Ener Energy Agency's mm -hmm. latest uh, projections, taking into account Glasgow pledges, to 1.5 degrees, which is the gap that we have for, for net zero by 2050. And it does make a lot of difference uh, because, as Tijo was saying, there will be huge costs to adaptation and the returns there are much more difficult to see because when you're thinking about global capital investing in the global south, uh, in the way of mitigation, for example, investing in renewable energy, investing in solutions that will limit temperature increases, then that is a benefit that is shared globally. So there is even a, a selfish, let's say, incentive for investing in those kind of projects. With adaptation, it's less clear because the benefits there are local. And even though they are much needed for the development um, and continued economic growth in those communities, uh, it's not something that would be shared in the same way. So flood defenses, um, et cetera, early warning systems, uh, forest management, and all those investments in, re in resilience and adaptation, energy efficiency in housing that, that are needed very much. Um, on what individuals can do and, and uh, carbon markets, et cetera, I think there's many models for that as well. Uh, we definitely need uh, governments to take a uh, action on that front because what we've seen so far is that a lot of the action has gone through the financial system by changing incentives for um, for loans, for investments, etc. And that's that's a powerful lever, but it cannot be the only one. Um, and I think focusing on on what the individuals can do also sometimes uh, shifts the focus away from the real responsibility, which does lie with governments, with the international financial system, international financial organizations, which, um, yes, are not perfect, but have really stepped up their role in many directions. Um, and I think uh, some examples are how you make this uh, adjust, um, adjustment as well, because you may impose, for example, carbon taxes, but compensate households that are most vulnerable uh, to those changes by giving them rebates or giving them some sort of support uh, and make sure that they are uh, acceptable. Because 
Otherwise, uh, there, we may face a reversal of these policies, which is something that we saw with globalization as well, which we haven't mentioned so much in the discussion today, but was also a very big process that while ge it generated uh, net benefits for the global economy, it was the benefits were not equally shared. And what we saw there was that because of these inequalities, a lot of movements to reverse it uh, were born. My country first type of policies, uh, deglobalization, reversal of, of some of those uh, 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 of some of those directions that had been beneficial for the global economy as a whole. And we cannot afford the same with climate because if uh, measures to support climate action um, hurt certain communities and then we have to reverse on that, that would be existential for everyone. So we need to make sure that any action also takes into account that development should be at the heart of, of climate policy and that economic development and climate action should go together uh, and not compromise each other. Thank you very much for that, Danai. We, we've got just about five minutes left, um, and th th there are a couple of other questions that have come in from uh, the, the public, but I'm, I'm going to use one of them as, as the, the final question, if that's okay. If I could ask you all, um, in, in between one and two minutes, given, given our time, what do you, if, 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 if you could, what do you think, what do we need to achieve at COP? What, 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 what is, what is your, your aim or, or your ambition for, for, for the, the climate conference in, in Glasgow next month? Will the North and South talk frankly to each other? How will we, how will we manage to get outcomes that actually deliver the change we need to see? And, and that question comes from Isabel in Sterling. So, so if, if I can move to Mike, then Danai and Tijal. And, if, if you use your last 90 seconds to, to say anything else you, you'd like to touch on. Thank you. Mike. Uh, thank you. Wow. Um, I think TJ made a really important point. Why have the markets in the North not actually responded uh, significantly? And, and, uh, and that's a very, very big question. We are still subsidising the wrong things. Um, we've got to stop doing that. We must put finance behind this because without the money to do it, it's not going to happen. Uh, and other than that, of course, I want to see the NDCs know that if we've got to move away from them being purely voluntary and whatever people feel like and try to somehow nail that down. There's no question in the North that we need to cut consumption. We need to reevaluate how and what we value moving forwards, what we actually think it's all about. Um, so, yeah, I think the I think it, within COP itself, which is not everything, it's quite narrow in some ways in its scope. I think it's about the financing. And it's about those commitments, of course. But beyond that, I hope that, and I know there's a lot of talk about this, but I would like to see us empower the communities that are more impacted now by the by climate change and actually get more of their, somehow find ways to give them teeth as well as give the environment teeth. Thank you, Mike. Then I. Yes, I think we're getting very close to COP now, so it's not about hopes, it's mostly about expectations because we've already seen most of the commitments that we are going to see on the government side. I mean, they're still coming through, but we saw quite a bit at the UN General Assembly, for example. I don't think we were we are going to see much more at COP. I would definitely hope, as Mike said, to see more clarity around the NDCs. Um, this is something that was agreed in Paris already uh, six years ago, so it is now about action, it is about delivery, and we need to see how do we get from A to B because uh, we have a lot of commitments about 2050 and the longer term but and, and most uh, organization governments will have uh, budgets and plans for the next one two years or so but what happens in the middle is less clear so we need to have credible plans about uh, how we get to net zero. And I think the second big item on the agenda is the climate finance and the 100 billion commitment to developing economies that uh, developed economies have pledged. And I think it's important to also think about the composition of that support, because um, what we've seen so far and the OECD tracks those numbers is that around one fifth of that has gone to uh, adaptation and resilience and around two thirds have gone to mitigation. So we should also think about if it's and it's not defeatist to say that we may not meet 1.5 degrees i think we need to be realistic about if that's where we're heading we need to invest in adaptation and resilience and that does not mean that we should shift our focus away from still aiming from 1.5 degree because the difference between 1.5 and 2 is is really very very significant in terms of the impacts that it will have on many communities thank you dinai and tijal thank you uh, I think uh, going into COP, uh, I agree with what 
then I think it is uh, this entire focus on net zero is highly inadequate if we want to still keep uh, 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius that we're talking about temperature. I think the IPCC report has been very clear that it is the cumulative emission, the remaining carbon budget that is key, and perhaps some discussion uh, on this if there is a uh, cost that it's not enough to declare net zero. You need to talk about how, how before you get to net zero. I think that is uh, uh, really important if we can get some discussion on that. And as we uh, talk about the global stock take, that's one of the discussions uh, coming up uh, in the COP, uh, and perhaps. That is where we have to talk about the science as well as equity, because the two things remain alive in Article 14 of the of the Paris. So if we are going to have a global stock take on those bases, then we need to talk about cumulative emissions, the remaining carbon budget, and what each of us uh, is going to take from that remaining carbon budget as uh, what is a fair share and what we are actually going to consume. I think that discussion is uh, very essential. Great. Thank you, Tijal. We must end there. We're just, just on one o'clock. Thank you all for joining us today and making such a big contribution to our, our, our panel, brought to you in partnership with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. A huge thanks to Danai Kirokopoulou, Mike Robinson and Tijal Kanitka for giving up your time to take part today. May I also take this opportunity to remind you that later on today we have a panel debating the importance of art and culture to human health and well-being at 2 p.m. Following that, our panel on resilient cities, and finally, the prioritizing mental health panel at six. I do hope you can join us for, for, for all or some of these sessions. Thank you all again. It's been a really interesting discussion and cheerio.